My dissertation is about the influence of early medieval Welsh tales and poems on the poetry of Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes was a Pembroke poet. He did his undergrad here at Pembroke. Um, and I'm especially interested in uh, the influence of the tales collected in Charlotte Guest's 19th century translation of what she called the Mabinagian. Um, this translation included the four branches of the Mabinagi, tales preserved in two 14th century Welsh manuscripts. Um, and also notably for my purposes, it includes the Hennes Taliesin, story of Taliesin, which uh, in its early extant manuscript version, uh, prose manuscript version dates from the 16th century and is thus a bit later than the other tales. Um, so I had read these tales, uh, The Four Branches and, and also the story of Taliesin, uh, shortly after I finished my undergraduate degree and I was so taken with them. Um, they're some of the most extraordinarily evocative literature I had ever come across, ever really. And I, uh, I read and reread and reread them um, and when I did my MFA at Johns Hopkins, I read uh, Ted Hughes for the first time, and I read a poem called uh, Crow Goes Hunting in, uh, in a graduate seminar. And Crow Goes Hunting is one of the poems from Ted Hughes's 1970 mythopoeic collection, Crow, from the Life and Songs of the Crow. And when I read this poem, I noticed that it seemed to be very vividly and very exactly retelling the story of Taliesin. Um, and it seemed to sort of be retelling it, but from the perspective of another character associated with that story, a character named Morvran, whose name literally means, means cormorant, um, but Mor is sea and Vran is a lenition of Bran, meaning crow. Um, so his name has been translated by some people, most notably uh, Robert Graves, as Sea Raven, and that's the translation of that name that Hughes would have known. Um, so I really noticed this, and I thought, well, I wonder if this if this crow figure um, is some kind of inspiration for Hughes's crow. Um, and then I looked into it and uh, tried to see if I could find anything about this, and it seemed like nobody had really noticed it or or written about it. Um, so I kept digging and I wound up going down to Ted Hughes's archive uh, at Emory University in Atlanta and spending a week there. Um, and I looked through his, his manuscripts um, and also through the, the books that Ted Hughes owned. Um, and notably, I discovered that in his, uh, his copy of Robert Graves' The White Goddess, he had really marked up this story of, of Taliesin. Um, and so that confirmed that he definitely did know this story. Um, and not only did he know it, it struck him enough for him to, to mark it. And, and anyone who's spent time in Ted Hughes's archive at Emory knows that he does not mark his books very much. Um, so finding a Ted Hughes annotation is very exciting. Um, and it's also a testament to the fact that something clearly did, did strike him. Um, and, and in the meantime, um, I had continued to read Ted Hughes's poetry, um, and I had realized that uh, it seemed like he was also retelling um, some of these Welsh stories, particularly the Mabinagi's fourth branch, uh, in his 1978 mythopoeic book, Cave Birds. Um, and I was also able to look at the manuscripts of that book and see that there were details in the manuscript versions that seemed to back up this idea that this Welsh story was kind of lurking behind this book. Um, so it, it began to become clear to me that this was a very pervasive interest. It spanned at least two of his books. Um, and I realized that I really wanted to, to pursue this further. And that was what inspired me to apply for this PhD to, to come to Cambridge um, and specifically to come to, to Pembroke College. We have a, a 1995 letter from Ted Hughes to Nick Gamage saying that he had read the Mabinagian by the time he was 15. Um, and then we also know that he encountered retellings of these stories in Robert Graves' The White Goddess, which was given to him as a going up present by his uh, grammar school English teacher, John Fisher. Um, so we know that he had read 
both of those texts um, by the time he reached Cambridge. Um, and I've been interested in, in trying to identify also other, other ways he may have encountered some of these, these stories or, or retellings of them. Um, so one thing I've done is gone through the, uh, the Pembroke College Library Registry, uh, which has, is the, is it's, it's this massive um, tome, which is the borrowing records of uh, every student who was matriculating at Pembroke uh, during the 1950s. So one thing that struck me in his borrowing records was seeing that he was reading the poetry of Edward Thomas here at Pembroke. And one thing that's really uh, delightful about doing this research at Pembroke is that you can see that he was reading Edward Thomas, and then you can go to the shelf and you can pull off the exact same edition of Edward Thomas that he checked out back in the 1950s. Um, and uh, that was interesting to me because Edward Thomas is an Anglo-Welsh poet uh, who mentions Mabinogian tales in his poems. Um, Ted Hughes really admired Edward Thomas. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, one of his poetic models, one of his, his role models, um, was an Anglo-Welsh poet who incorporated some of this Welsh material into his poems, which would have perhaps been all the more incentive for Ted Hughes to sort of forge his own relationship to this, this early literature. Um, and uh, another really uh, exciting and, and rewarding and interesting part of my research has been uh, traveling to Aberystwyth in Wales to meet with a man named Daniel Hughes, uh, who is the, the world expert on Welsh manuscripts. Um, so much of what we know about the textual histories of these stories we owe to, to one man's research, and that is, that is Daniel Hughes. Um, and Daniel Hughes uh, was very, very close friends with Ted Hughes when they were both students at Cambridge. Um, and so while he was at Cambridge, Ted Hughes also had a more uh, personal source of knowledge about early Welsh literature. And uh, when, I, when I spoke to Daniel Hughes, he did indeed say that they, they spoke about the Mabinagian tales um, when they were students here and, and, and afterwards. Um, Ted Hughes briefly lived with Daniel Hughes in London when he and Plath had just gotten married and they didn't want to live together because they were worried the Fulbright Commission would revoke her scholarship if they knew that she was married. Um, so Daniel Hughes and, and Ted Hughes lived together in, uh, in London at 18 Rugby Street, which would take on its own mythic proportions in birthday letters. Um, and uh, one thing that was notable about their time together at that flat was that uh, the previous tenant was a lawyer who had left behind his library, which included um, some books about early medieval Welsh literature. And there are some letters that Ted Hughes wrote to Sylvia Plath shortly after uh, arriving in London at 18 Rugby Street. Uh, and he tells her about these books and he says, the books aren't much, but the stories are. I may find a use for them. And he did. And the other really interesting thing about those books is that they actually inspired Daniel Hughes to go enroll in a paleography course at the, at the British Library, and that launched him towards his career. He became keeper of records and manuscripts at, uh, he became keeper of manuscripts and records at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, and then of course went on to a very, very illustrious uh, scholarly career looking at the history of Welsh manuscripts. One way of thinking about that question or answering that question is to say that uh, Ted Hughes's first wife, Sylvia Plath, died by suicide in, uh, in 1963, and Crow was really the book that he wrote in the wake of her death, um, and, and Cayford's uh, 1978 was also a book that came out of the wake of that death. Um, and uh, his, his love of early Welsh literature was something that he really shared with Plath. There's a wonderful 1956 letter to Plath's mother from Plath um, talking about the fact that they had just bought a book of Celtic tales and Ted Hughes was reading it aloud to her while she peeled mushrooms for dinner. And that book of tales was Kel Kenneth Hurlston Jackson's Celtic Miscellany. And, um, it includes uh, the story of Morvren from a slightly different angle, but an angle that's also relevant to Crow, um, and also it includes aspects of the Mabinagi's fourth branch. So we can see this Welsh literature also infusing Plath's poetry. Um, and so I think that Hughes, after Plath's death, was looking for a way to 
not only memorialize their relationship, but also respond to Plath's poetry, respond to her last book, Ariel. And I think that this Welsh literature was uh, in some ways a shared language for them, a shared literary language. And repurposing these tales allowed him in some ways to respond to Plath's poetry, but in a way that was veiled, in a way that wasn't open to public scrutiny. Um, so that's, that's one way of thinking about why he chose to retell some of these tales. Um, another way of, of answering that question is to say that the, the narratives of these tales coincide in some really fascinating ways with some of Hughes's occult and spiritual in interests, um, interests that were really abiding ones and, and spanned his career. And one of Hughes's most perhaps important interests throughout his life was his interest in, in shamanism. Um, and uh, in shamanism, we see this motif of uh, dismemberment and rebirth. Um, and in these Welsh tales, we also see that. We see this image of um, death or dismemberment that leads in some way to some kind of new lease on life, some kind of new transformation. Um, and, and finally, Hughes was also very interested in alchemy, both alchemy and Jungian alchemy. Um, and uh, in these Welsh tales that he's retelling, we see the image of the cauldron coming back again and again. So I think when we take all of this together, we see that these tales not only played a really meaningful personal role in Ted Hughes's life, um, they also coincided with some of his most dearly held interests and beliefs. Um, and in this way, I think he loved them for themselves, but he also found in them a reflection of other ideas and other beliefs that he really lived by. Um, and in that way, I think these tales became sort of poetic touchstones for him for, throughout, his, throughout his writing life.